Right. Good evening, everyone. We are looking to start in the next probably 10 minutes time. So essentially, I'm looking forward to having all you folks here today. It's going to be absolutely great. We've got Anson Lee here. We've got Prema here. Fantastic to see you all. I'm just going to set my camera right, which should be better now. And uh, if you folks can just confirm that you can hear me properly, that'll be fantastic. I'm just going to organize my camera. And I think you should be able to see me properly as well now which is fantastic. And if any of you can just, just put it on the chat that you can hear me, you can see me. Prav, Prema, Anison, Mike, James, if you can just confirm that it's all good. In actual fact, I can write a question to you all. How about this? Why don't I actually chat with you guys and then you lot can confirm. Uh, here we go. Right. Hello. All see and hear me. Perfect, great. And you can all see me because we are literally going to be starting in the next eight minutes or so. So, and Sergi, am I on mute? Uh, I'm not sure, Prema, if you're on mute. You are on mute, so I can't hear you. I can I can unmute you if you'd like, but you are technically on mute. So, uh, no, I, I can't hear you. But it's uh, okay. No worries. <laughs> That's fine. So literally folks, seven minutes to go and we're gonna start this webinar. Please, if you have any specific questions that you really want me to answer, put them on the chat. I will certainly go through it with you. If you're at work, try to give yourself a bit of a break to switch your phone off, really pay attention to this webinar because I want to make sure that you have a wonderful, wonderful experience on your non-medical prescribing course. You don't make the mistakes that I made you get the best out of your course. So certainly the best thing to do is switch your phones off and any questions you have, write it on the chat. We're literally gonna be starting in the next seven minutes. And at this point, I think I'm comfortable to share my slides, which is great. And here we go. And we will be starting very, very soon. Literally give it another seven minutes time when we go through this. But essentially, I just wanna make sure that all of you are absolutely clear on how to become a non-medical prescriber, my scope of practice, what the course in itself entails, how to find a DMP, what about the application form, which university should I go to, which shouldn't I go to, how much does it cost? We're also going to be going through how you can transition and develop your clinical skills. Should I do a clinical diploma? Should I not do a clinical diploma? how to find a DMP, which seems to be one of the biggest, biggest questions. Should I choose a pharmacist as a DMP? Should I choose a doctor as a DMP? So we're gonna go through everything step-by-step. Step. That's essentially the plan. So I demystify all to do with non-medical prescribing for you. What is non-medical prescribing? What is independent prescribing? What is level six? What is level seven? All these questions that I get asked, I'm absolutely gonna answer them for you. And we intend to start this very soon. So Anson, Hoda, Mamuna, we have Minal, Nihal, Prav, Prema, Sonota, Zora, James, Mike, Shane. We have, who else do we have? We have Andres. We've got plenty of people here today, which is fantastic because it means that I can cover everything in one go. So five minutes to go, and I'm gonna demystify everything that you need to know about non-medical prescribing within the allotted time. I intend to start at seven o'clock and hopefully finish for about seven, 7.45 actually, not seven, 7.45. So in the next five minutes, we're gonna break it down. In the meantime, use this opportunity to get yourselves familiar with each other. Put your name down folks, introduce yourself. You know, we've got Sanuta, Sofia, we've got uh, Ilham, we've got Harbs, we've got Mamona, we've got Minhal. Introduce yourself folks, you know, tell your colleagues who you are, you should be networking with each other. You should be getting to know each other. We need to build our pharmacy network. So we're, we're in it together. So please do do that. If you can, I'll start by introducing myself in a minute when I get my webinar started. So all of you guys, don't be shy. Who are you? Just start off by telling your name. Hey, my name is Mohammed. I'm a community pharmacist. Nice to meet you all. When somebody starts, then everybody starts to talk and we can make it into a great session. So. I want this to be very, very interactive. I want you folks to enjoy it. I want you folks to have a great time. In the next four minutes, we're gonna break it down step by step. 
A lot of you guys are joining as I'm speaking, so I welcome all of you to this webinar. You're not late. We got literally a minute to go. Thank you very much for someone who's uh, brilliant. Prema, very appreciate. Hey, now you guys are talking, right? Sonata, thank you very much. Prema, thank you very much for explaining who you are. I think it's quite polite as well. So for those of you who can talk, please do write it down. Get to know each other. You know, let's get this convo. Let's start to build our network with each other. So don't be shy. Nobody knows who you are. The only person you can see is me. Nobody else can see you. Nobody else knows what you look like. It's only me you can see. So it doesn't matter. Write it down. Get yourselves to know each other. Hello, Prema. Fantastic. Great to have you here. Hi, Sonata. Again, pra Parav, great to see you here. Hi, Parav. Beautiful. This is exactly like what I like to see is people conversating. We've got three minutes left, folks. So if you have any particular questions that you'd like me to address. Hi, Mohammed. Fantastic. Thank you very much for engaging. Really appreciate that. It's just, I want you guys to have a great time. And there's two ways that we can do it. I keep going on and on and on and on and keep talking or you folks engage with each other. This is great. Ilham, thank you. Mary, thank you. Mohammed, thank you. Man, this is beautiful. I'm loving this. Minal, thank you. Sophia, fantastic. Great to have you here. Uh, nice to meet you all. This is absolutely wonderful. Beautiful to see folks are engaging with each other. And uh, Hubs, nice to have you here. We got two minutes left. And in this two minute time, we're about to start. And I'm actually going to start this recording now, which is fantastic. Bismillah rahman rahim Here we go. So everyone, thank you very much for being here. We've got two minutes to go. But before we start, I really want to clarify some points on exactly why is it that I do what I do. So essentially, this is it. I want you folks to be the best versions of yourselves. I feel life is very short and we should all live it to our max and we should feel happy by what we do. If you're a pharmacist, I want my pharmacist to love what they do. If you're a doctor, I want you to love what you do. This is essentially what I want to do. And that's why I'm here. And I want to answer every question that you have in as much as detail as possible. I'm here to learn as much as you're here to learn. There are certain things that I know, there are certain things that you know. So as much as I love to share my knowledge, I also love to gain knowledge as well. So keep that in mind. So do share your knowledge. Any questions you have, do let me know. But essentially, that's my, that is my why. If anybody asks me, you know, why is it you get up in the morning at four o'clock? Why is it that you do these webinars? This is it. I believe that we should have a world where it's the best best place to be. We shouldn't have to worry about COVID-19 and people not having access to oxygen. We shouldn't have to worry about people dying of poverty. That is why I believe healthcare professionals should be the best versions of themselves. And we play huge roles in people's lives. So together we can change this world. And according to my watch, it is about to be seven o'clock. So I welcome all of you to this webinar. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Fahim. I'm a pharmacist prescriber, contractor, founder of Medlearn, pharmacist of the year to the 19, finalist in 2020, award-winning pharmacist in 2020, and also was a judge on multiple award ceremonies as well. So you can follow me on YouTube, you can follow me on LinkedIn, and you can follow me on the Pharmacy Business Awards. So certainly do that. And I welcome all of you folks to be here. And essentially, let's go through this step by step. So. My vision is I want to create a world where every single one of us wakes up really happy with what we do. You wake up every morning thinking, I can't wait to do what I do. And you come home feeling fulfilled. That is what I want. Whether you're a pharmacist and you're at work right now, ask yourself, are you happy? Whether you're a dentist, whether you're a doctor, whatever you might be, look at yourself in the mirror and ask yourself, am I fulfilled by what I'm doing? Do I wake up every single day thinking, I can't wait for today. I can't make, wait to make a difference. That is essentially what I want to do is I want you guys to love what you do while you're doing it. And when you come home, you're smiling, you're fulfilled, you're making a difference to your lives and people's lives. And I believe one of the ways that we can do that is by investing in ourselves. From there, making money because money is very, very important. It's a tool that you need to go on to achieve your dreams and helping people. That's essentially what my vision is. Again, that's just a 
Just to introduce myself, Dr. Akib, Dr. Ben, Dr. Rahimi, there's a range of us here or there to support you, but we won't be worrying about that too much. Essentially, today is all about non-medical prescribing. The first thing I want you all to understand from this webinar is find a problem and solve it. Remember these words, find a problem, find a problem and solve it. If you can remember this, you can never go wrong in anything that you do. Whether it's working in general practice, whether it's working in community pharmacy, or whether you're looking to become a non-medical prescriber. If you can solve a problem, you will always do well. Financially, you will have demand, you will always do well. The problem that we're trying to solve here is that the NHS needs us. The NHS has made it very clear that there's a shortage of doctors, shortage of nurses. I wrote an article a couple of weeks ago in the Pharmacy Business Awards. There are 2.8 doctors to 1,000 people in this country. We have a shortage. So the NHS has turned over to pharmacists and nurses. Pharmacists and nurses that you folks need to be prepared for the future. And we need you to be able to start to diagnose, manage and treat. Now, someone tell me, if in the next four to five years, pharmacists are not able to diagnose, manage and treat, do you really feel that you are going to be adding value to the future of our profession and your work? Honestly, ask yourself this question. Somebody write it on the chat. Tell me Ashanti, tell me Callum, tell me Dimitriv, tell me someone, anybody tell me, what do you think? If you don't develop your clinical skills or don't continually strive forward, do you think that you're gonna be adding value to your profession and your, and your work? Yes or no, simple, it's not right or wrong. There is, no, there is no right and wrong, it's your opinion. I believe that as individuals, thank you, Mohammed. I believe as people, we should always strive to move forward and continually improving, continually getting better by what we do, continually moving forward. Whether you're a pharmacist, whether you're a doctor, whether you're a footballer, whether you're a, a boxer, whatever it might be, continually keep moving forward. So, you know, we need to just keep up to date Thank you, Parab, that's the right way to put it, that we need to keep up to date. And the NHS has made it very clear, folks. And they've said that by 2025, we want pharmacists to start prescribing. Simple. We want pharmacists to be prescribers. We want you to solve this problem. Why? Because every time a patient goes to the out of hours when he could be seen by the community, it is costing around 45, 50 pound per consultation. How much do you think it costs for one bed in hospital? One bed in hospital, how much does it cost? One night, on average, who knows? How much does it cost one night on average if somebody who could have been seen in a community ends up in hospital? Tell me a number. Thank you, Izzedine. Absolutely, you're looking at 600 to about a thousand pound per night. And the NHS is saying, why aren't they being seen in the community? And you're absolutely right, Ahmed that this is a turning point for the profession, so it's an opportunity for you. So the problem is this, I want you to, without dwelling on this too much, there's a 3000 shortage each year of GPs. That is the problem that you're trying to solve. Remember that, keep that in mind. Now, because this is a lecture, I don't like to say the word lecture, this is a, a discussion on non-medical prescribing, let's clarify some things. First of all, when I use the term non-medical prescribing and independent prescribing, I mean the same thing. So. Let me clarify this. When you have an independent prescriber, the independent prescriber could be a medical prescriber and a medical prescriber could be a doctor or a nurse, or that prescriber could be a independent non-medical prescriber. And if you're a non-medical prescriber, you're gonna be a nurse, pharmacist, physio, and whoever on all the others who can prescribe. Does this make sense to you? When I use the term non-medical prescribing or independent prescribing, I'm using it very loosely. Are we all clear with that? So don't get mumbled up. I get a lot of students asking me, hey Fahim, I don't wanna be an independent prescriber. I wanna be a non-medical prescriber. It's the same thing. It's just the differentiation. An independent prescriber, either you're a medic or you're a non-medic. If you're a medic, you're a dentist or a doctor. If you're a non-medic, you're a nurse, pharmacist, physio and so on. I hope that's absolutely clear for you guys. And that's clarified. Now, without going into my theory, I need you all to understand this point. 
you must understand this because this will make a lot of sense to you later on. So in 1986, essentially the Cumberledge report, what they found was that nurses were diagnosing, but the GP was prescribing. So you had the nurse here, there she is. And I'm sorry, nurses, it's not the best of picture. There's the nurse and she would call up the doctor and she would speak with the doctor and the doctor would write the script. Now you tell me what's the problem with this? What is the problem with this arrangement with the GP prescribing and the nurse doing the diagnosis? What's the problem with this arrangement? What is the issue with this arrangement? Imagine I was your prescriber and you were doing the diagnosis, but I was writing the script. Tell me somebody what's the problem with this arrangement? What is wrong with this? Why don't we continue like this? Why don't I just act as your prescriber and you people see patients, but I, I write the script. What is the fundamental problem with this arrangement? Who can tell me? Time consuming, nurse could prescribe herself. It's not direct service, too many people steps involved. Yes, Sophia, thank you very much. You are all right. One of the biggest problems with this is accountability. Absolutely Harb's accountability. Who is responsible? Is it the nurse who's doing the diagnosis? Or is it the doctor who wrote the script? And that's a problem. And the reality is that when something goes wrong, do you think that I'm going to look after, or do you think someone's going to look after their professional number or your professional number? It's a rhetorical question, don't answer it. But the point is that when things go wrong, everybody looks after themselves. And the other problem is there's no accountability here. So what they decided was, hold on, if this is happening, then why don't we allow nurses to prescribe? Does that make sense to you all? They did a report, they went into studies and they found actually nurses are safe in prescribing. But I need you to understand something. The nurses had the clinical skills. You must remember this everyone. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna prove a point to you today, what one of the universities has said. So the nurses had the clinical skills. When the nurses were diagnosing, they had the clinical skills. They could take a history. They could do an examination. They could pick up the phone and say, Hobbs, I've got this patient here. This was his history. He's drooling. He's unable to close his mouth. His uvula is deviated to one side. He has a peritensilular abscess. I want to refer him to hospital. Makes sense. I have a patient in front of me. I have done an auscultation. He has rails or he has crepitus and he's dullness to percussion. I think he's got a pneumonia. I need you to write a script. Can you see, You please understand this point that when the nurses were given the rights to prescribe, they could already diagnose and treat. Now, from this slide, keep that in mind. There's two things I've told you today. Independent prescribing and non-medical prescribing are technically the same. It's just a division. When this course of non-medical prescribing was introduced and nurses could diagnose and treat, they had the clinical skills. The entire non-medical course is on that premises that a pharmacist or a nurse or a doctor, well, a pharmacist or a nurse has, has, has the clinical skills. This is what it's built on. Why this is important, because it will make sense to you in a moment. You have to understand this point that if you are looking to do your non-medical prescribing, you should have the clinical skills. Then you work your way through non-medical prescribing. And there's a university, I'll show you the actual application form where they have written, do you have skills in anatomy and physiology? Can you diagnose, manage and treat? Then come on this course. And it's a really good eye opener for all of you who are looking to do non-medical prescribing to understand the non-medical prescribing course does not teach you clinical skills. Let me write that down in absolute bold. No clinical skills teaching. And we are going to look at a, we are going to look at a program. We are going to look at the application form. I'm going to go through this step by step. They do not teach you clinical skills. It is your responsibility to have your clinical skills already there. And then you gain your qualification. And right now you might be thinking, Fahim, what are you telling us? This cannot be true. You are not telling the truth. You're making this up. 
I'm going to go explain this to you and tell you why I am telling the truth. I'm not making it up. So, right. Number one, from this slide, you the nurses had the clinical skills. They already had the experience. It was an easy transition to say, right, remove this from here. And you can now write the script yourself because you're already diagnosing and treating and you're safe. In June 1997, they said, yes, other professionals should be able to prescribe. In 2002, we had the supplementary prescriber. And then in 2005, you had the pharmacist independent prescriber. You know what independent prescriber is? Essentially, you, you take the responsibility. So that's a bit of background knowledge. We don't want to go to too much theory. Let's move on. So let's actually go through step by step how to become a prescriber. Okay. First of all, university. I'm going to go through this. Which university should I go to? How do I pick a university? First of all, let's all of us together go onto the internet and let's show you how you're going to pick a course. Number one, what you're going to do, you're going to log on to, not onto YouTube, you're going to go to Google. You're going to go to Google. Can you see my, can you see my Google screen? Can someone just confirm you can see my Google screen? Somebody write it on the chat and I think that's a yes. Great. Okay, you're going to go into Google and you're going to type in GPHC independent prescribing. You are then going to click on this link here. And after you've done this, folks, the next thing that you're going to do is you're going to make your way down and you're going to click on GPHC. You're going to click on not the entry requirements, you're going to click on the course itself. And here you go. You're going to click on this. You're going to go on to accredited independent prescribing course. And you're going to click on this link. This is the first thing that you're going to do. You're going to say, Fahim, easy peasy. I'm going to log on. I'm going to click on this. I'm now going to get a list of universities that come up. I'm going to get a huge list of universities that are going to come up. And I'm going to select these. Now, in terms of your selection criteria, in terms of your selection criteria, which university to go for, I would say that your decision should be based on, number one, how familiar you are with the university yourself. Number two, the cost. Number three, how close it is to you. Number four, the type of teaching. Now with COVID, a lot of universities have gone online. And not every university, in my opinion, is totally equipped to be able to teach online. So you need to make a decision, first of all, which university are you familiar with? Number one, maybe you've gone to a particular university, you like them. Number two, what is the cost? So most universities will cost between 2,000 to 3,000 pounds. Number two, you want to go to which one is close to you because you need to think about your face-to-face -face days. So at university, you're gonna to have to attend anything between eight to 15 days face-to-face -face classes. Face-to-face -face classes. And every time you take off work, it's gonna cost you. So remember that although it's costing you two to 3,000 pound, do include your face-to-face -face days. These are normally mandatory. Between eight to 15 days are mandatory, but this can vary university to university. You also need to think of 90 hours with your DMP, okay? And out of those 90 hours, around 45 hours are mandatory. You have to do with your DMP, and we'll get into that in a moment. So eight days face-to-face, -face, eight to 15, 45 hours mandatory. So you're looking at, if you spend four hours, if you did, let's say you did, uh, let's say you did, 12, 12 study days, technically, 12 study days. So in total, you're looking at about 20 days off you need to cover this. So 20 days off times, let's do simple maths. Who can do simple math? 20 days times 20 pound an hour work. You can do the maths of how much it's going to cost you, which does not include a university fee. So remember, university is one side, but there is this side to factor in as well. Keep that in mind. So that's what you're going to decide. So in terms of choosing a university, honestly, having worked with majority of the universities, there isn't a single one that I could recommend. They're all the same. There isn't a single university that I could say, folks, go to this university, they're great. The reality is the learning outcomes, the criteria is the same for all the universities. 
I would suggest that you email the university and ask what they cover in their syllabus. That's going to be important, but they're all the same. You need to think about price around two to three thousand pounds. Can you afford that? Then you have to think of how much study days are going to be involved. So Fahim is saying between eight to 15 face to face and also time with my DMP. That is your criteria. Also, how close is it? It does not matter which university you go to. Please, please, please do not pick on brand. Whether it's King's, whether it's Oxford, whether it's Cambridge, nobody cares. When you're a pharmacist, you are a master's level student. It does not make a difference which university you go to. It does not matter one bit to anybody. No one's going to say, hey, Mohammed, you're a King's University qualified, non-medical prescriber. We're going to take you one. Nobody cares. They're only interested in you getting on that register. Once you become annotated, that is it. That is your points about university. Which university should I go to, Fahim? It doesn't matter. Make a decision based on price. Make a decision based on which university you're familiar with. Make a decision based on which is closer to you. Make a decision based on essentially what type of teaching they're going to offer. Do you offer additional training? Do you support the student? How do you support the student? Do it based on that. There is essentially nothing else from university point of view to go through, but these are the universities that you need to select. Okay, if you've got any particular questions regarding university, which one to go to, write them in the chat. I'll answer them at the end, should I get a chance. But I believe I've covered everything there from university. You folks ask which university, that is it one to decide. Your criteria should be familiarity, cost, how close it is, and type of teaching they deliver. And when I mean type of teaching, I mean, do you deliver face-to-face -face or are you online? What do you teach? Face-to-face -face or online? What do you teach? Is it face-to-face -face or online? I also get asked the question, are some universities harder than others? No, they're all the same and I'll go through what's expected of you. Are there any units easier than others? No, <laughs> no, all of them have a very similar structure that you have to go through. I'll go through that with you. So there isn't one uni that's easier than the other. They're all the same. They all have the same and students do fail this course as well. I'll go through with you what's expected. So thank you for that question, Ahmed. If you have any questions regarding universities, write them on the chat, but that covers that. Okay, let's keep working through it. Let's go through the application form. I get a lot of students say to me, hey Fahim, help me with the application form. Right, let me go through the application form for you then. Let's do this next. What will they ask you in the application form? So you can see my screen. I'm about to end this show, which should work here. And we're about to open up a blank application form. Can I confirm that you can all see this blank application form? Yes, that's a yes. Fantastic, great. Okay, right. Uh, oh, Shamila, any university stay clear of? I don't think I'm allowed to actually bad math in university actually so i don't think i can answer that question i don't think i'm allowed, i don't think i'm allowed to bad math them so i can't answer that question but uh, maybe i could be a bit indirect in a moment okay so every university will ask you what do you want to do essentially what you want to do is you want to take the independent and supplementary prescribing course okay don't worry about a post graduate diploma in enhanced clinical practice, advanced clinical practice, all this stuff. I'll go through all this stuff in a moment. Don't worry yourself too much about this. That's the first thing that you're gonna take. The second thing that you're gonna take is you're gonna ask for your personal information. I'm sure you folks are comfortable with this. You're a pharmacist, you're registered with the GPHC, and I am practicing in a clinical environment where NMP, ACP is required. This is important. They want you to utilize your skill I'll get you in that in a moment. Those days are long gone where a pharmacist could be working in industry and then apply to become a prescriber. They now want to know, are you gonna use this skill and justify it to us? And I'll show you in a moment what I mean by this. I'll show you in a moment to justify this point. You've then got personal details. That is easy peasy, unless you don't know your personal details and we're stuck. That's not too hard. Funding. So the universities want to know how you're funding for the course. Are you... Funding yourself, which is totally fine, is somebody paying it for you. It does not matter both ways, whoever's funding it, they just want to make sure if somebody's funding it for you, you have the support. So that's another question you have to answer. Again, pretty straightforward. The next question they're asking you, and again, they ask you about the first degree in health related subject, essentially that, that question I still don't understand. 
why they ask that question. I think they want to know if you've got various other degrees. Maybe you might be a, a nurse or something else before. Not that it's that relevant, to be honest, but there's some universities ask that question. You need to be registered with this. You must meet the entry criteria. Now, you might say, hey, Fahim, what is the entry criteria? What are you talking about? If you are unsure what the entry criteria is, again, folks, very, very straightforward. All you're going to do, check this out. You are going to tick on the, but there is, I would suggest that you read this. That's a previous standard. You have a look at this. See the new standards for education training for prescribers here. And also here, which I'd recommend that you read as well. There's a wonderful document. Guess what it says? It says entry requirements. So pretty straightforward. So have a read of this. It lists exactly what the entry requirements are. And to be honest, if I quickly go and open this up, really quickly, page not found, Got great. Thank you very much for not showing the page. Can I just confirm that you can all see this, right? I'm not just talking to myself, am I? Can you see this folks? I'm guessing you're saying yes, which is good, good. Okay, so entry requirements, pretty straightforward. Let's have a look, here you go. So first of all, this is really straightforward. You need to be registered with a GPHC. You need to be in good standing, at least two years appropriate patient orientated training, two years, at least two years appropriate. And it's two years from when you qualify unless things have changed, okay? Applicants have identified the area of clinical or therapeutic practice in which they develop the independent prescribing. They must also have relevant clinical or therapeutic experience in the area, which is suitable. And I'll demonstrate that in a moment, why that's important because some universities are actually changing the entry requirements. Some universities are changing the entry requirements and we're gonna get through that in a second. Back onto the application form, are you all with me? Are you all with me on this journey, right? We're back on the application form. Can you see the application form? Everyone let me know. Good, perfect. Okay, so, right. Then what they're going to ask you is where you're currently doing your prescribing, are you employed by them or are you going to be doing it separately? And you just tick that box. So it says, I am employed in an organization that has agreed or I have an arrangement with a partnership organization. How do you intend to do this? You tick this, okay? If you're looking to do an aesthetics then you have to fill this section out, you need to have, please, please, please make sure that you have an enhanced DBS certificate. Get this done first. You need an enhanced DBS certificate. Otherwise this can slow down the entire process. Keep that in mind. Now, this needs to be, somebody has to support your practice. So either your line manager or somebody has to support your practice. That might be your superintendent pharmacist. Maybe if you're locoming for regular organization, somebody has to vouch for you that we will support you. You cannot just do it on your own. You can't just go anywhere and just say, I'll just become a prescriber with no one to support you. For some reason, universities want this. They want an organization to support you. Simply because if you don't have an organization supporting you, where will you use this practice? So that's why they want you to do that. Coming down again, they want a signature from your line manager. And then they want a signature from whichever area you are, who's the lead prescribing, who's in charge of the lead prescribing there. So they want that as well. So what you've learned so far, number one, entry requirements. Number two, there's these forms to fill out. Number three, I do need an organization to support me. That organization could be somewhere that you're regularly low coming for. It could be your GP practice. It could be your community pharmacy. It could be your community pharmacy. It could be, it could be anyone, it could be someone that for example, we help a lot of students with their prescribing. We could do that for you, but someone needs to support you, okay? Also, DBS, don't forget that, enhanced. Once you've done this, you need to have your non-medical, your designated prescribing practitioner. You have to have a DPP, which is essentially a designated prescribing practitioner. And that can be a doctor, that can be suitable qualified pharmacist, it can be a nurse, but I will touch on this in a moment on who to go with and how to decide. So you need to have that in place. If you don't have that in place, then you have, then you're stuck. And please make sure if you do choose a prescriber, he has experience in teaching. He has looked after pharmacists before and ideally it should be a doctor in my opinion, or if you are gonna go with a non-doctor, 
do check what experience they have in teaching. Do check have they taught pharmacists before. Otherwise, I don't think it's giving you value. Remember, if you are going to become a prescriber, they need to give you value as much as you need to give them value. Remember that. Keep that in mind. No one is doing you any favors. So if they're going to become your prescriber, expect them to look after you as well. Okay. So once you've done that, there's a form that has to be filled out again. They need to be qualified for three years. They need to have the right experience. This all has to be there. And then there has to be a signature from them as well. Once you've got that, again, there has to be a, after that, it's, it's uh, after that, it's your personal statement. After this is your personal statement that has to be filled out, which is gonna be important. And that's your personal assessment. Uh, so if I'm in a community and IP is not one of the services providing my pharmacy, I will have to change my job. No, 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 no. I'll go through your scope of practice in a moment. What? Okay, let me justify that now. Wait, wait, no, I'll do that in order. Sorry, Ahmed, keep hold that thought. I'll get back to you on this. Okay, then you've got to fill out your application form. And in this personal statement is about you. This is where you're going to demonstrate that there's a need for it. Let me give you an example. All of your pharmacists must be aware of the GPCPCS service. Am I right or wrong? You all should be familiar with this. You all should also be familiar with the fact that the NHS will expect community pharmacists to be diagnosing and managing disease. That's what they want you to do. And if you go on the PSNC website, there is a list of conditions that the GPHC or the PC, PSNC want you that want you to be able to treat because the GPs can refer this to you. So if you go to GP CPCS list of conditions, here we can see, I think it's somewhere here that there's a list of conditions somewhere here, aim of service, list, 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 where's the list? Service level agreement. Where's the list? Here you go. These are a list. This is exactly what they want you to do. From acne, all the way to constipation, cold and flu, diarrhea, ear discharge, earwax, earache, sore throat, tonsillitis, everything is here. This is what they want you to do. So if you are working in a community pharmacy, absolutely you have a scope of practice and this should be your scope of practice. I'll get into that in a moment. Any one of these areas you can do. So when you're applying for your application, you will justify that the GPCPCS service expects pharmacists to diagnose and treat a range of conditions. I am already seeing patients. And let me, let me clarify this point right now to you. Let's clarify something for you folks. Let me clarify something right now to you. Can someone tell me, can someone tell me, well, you can't tell me actually. Look what this says here, suitability. You have appropriate background knowledge of anatomy and physiology. Can you see this? Before you're prescribing, the universities are checking that do you actually have the skills? Number one. Number two, what they're checking is are you currently independently assessing and diagnosing in your current role? Are you doing this at the moment? And as a pharmacist, yes, you are doing this. How you're doing this is when a patient presents to you with earache, or let's say a patient says to you with a sore throat. How many of you take a history and assess that patient? You do it right. Whether you give them Dequadin, whether you give them Tyrosets, you ask questions, you make a decision, and then you diagnose them. Sure, you're not giving antibiotics, but do you agree with me that you're assessing patients? Who disagrees with me? Who disagrees? Is there anybody here who disagrees with me? Are you all in agreement that it might be on a different scale, but you are assessing patients? When a patient comes for chlorophenical eye drops, you're assessing that. When a patient comes in with an earache, you're assessing that. When a patient comes in for a rash, you're assessing it. Now, your assessment might be not that good. Your assessment may be great, but you are doing it. So, Ahmed, you do not need to change your job, but you need to think about which patients am I seeing in my current role? And that is the area that I should develop myself initially. When you become a prescriber, you can develop your skill set into any other condition you want. But for university, they want you to pick a very narrow, a very specific condition. 
your scope of practice should be the area in which you are seeing patients currently. A community pharmacist, unless you have a unless you have a clinic set up where you're seeing hypertension and you're seeing hypertensive patients and you're managing them, is that the most appropriate role for you? How many of you in your pharmacy do spirometry or do, do lung function tests? If you're not doing spirometry and you're not doing lung function tests, should you do your prescribing role in asthma? Does it make sense? How many of you are running a hypertension clinic right now? How many of you are seeing hypertensive patients where you do the history? You take the bloods, you do the readings, you send all that information off to the GP. The GP then you have, you're acting as a supplementary prescriber and then you're diagnosing and treating. Most of you in community pharmacy probably aren't doing this. Then why are you picking hypertension? Remember what I said, once you qualify, you can develop your scope of practice into anything you want. So you might start with, for example, otitis externa, after that, you could branch out. You could branch out and say, okay, I'm now going to develop my skills in hypertension. I'm now going to develop my skills in asthma. I'm now going to develop my skills in aesthetics. I'm now going to develop my skills, for example, in, in congestive heart failure. But initially, remember, you need to be utilizing your skill in the field that you're working. For a community pharmacist, it is your minor illnesses. Unless you were one like one of my students who had a warfarin clinic set up with the local arrangement by CCG. So she wanted to do it in warfarin, stroke prevention makes sense. Unless you're working in an area, for example, that you are gonna be seeing hypertensives and you've got a system set up, that's fine. But most of you, how many of you are, are have given, have treated UTI on a PGD? How many of you? Anybody here? How many of you, just put it on the chat, yes. UT on PGD, how many of you have prescribed, uh, in, have worked in a travel clinic and you've given travel medicine? How many of you have given ear calm for a, for a, for earache? So you all have done this. So you can pick any of these conditions, but ask yourself, look at yourself in the mirror and say, okay, what kind of patient, how many of you have seen eczema? How many of you patients have seen impetigo? How many of you patients have seen acne? How many, not patients, how many of you people have seen, have seen UTIs? How many of you people have seen pharyngitis? You've seen it all. But how many of you honestly have seen hypertension on a daily basis or asthma? I'm not saying that is that you can't do. I'm saying when you're sat with your doctor, if you're not seeing these patients in your practice, how will you develop your skills? It doesn't make sense. Does the scope of practice make sense to everyone? Are you all clear in the scope of practice? Pick an area and a area, do not pick minor illnesses. Do not say my scope of practice is minor illnesses. Make it more specific. Make it more specific. Say, right, I'm going to do minor illnesses. I'm gonna start off with a UTI. I'm gonna start off with a UTI that is uncomplicated. So no pregnancy, no catheters, no males, no children, no, uh, you know, no one with recurrent infections. I'm gonna pick a UTI in females between 18 and 40 who are systemically well, that's my area. I'm going to pick an earache in an adult patient who does not have discharge. I'm going to pick a sore throat in a patient who does not have symptoms of a quincy. Are you with me? A minor illness is too big. It is too broad. You, because the broader you keep your topic, at university, they will expect you to write essays. They will expect you to sit an exam and they will expect you to pick an OSCE. If you become Superman and you pick everything, do you think you're doing yourself any favors? No, don't answer that question. Right. Wow, we are, we're doing well. I think we're doing well. I think we're doing lovely so far. I think we're doing really well. Okay, so that gone. Let's go back onto the application form. So everyone, application forms, tip number one, DBS check, enhance. Tip number two, personal statement. You need a personal statement. Tip number three, you have to have a doctor 
or a D or DPP, a designated prescribing practitioner. We'll get into that in a second, how to find one. You have to have that. Number four, scope of practice, be real with yourself. Imagine you picked a scope of practice that you were seeing every day. As you develop your skills, you can practice your craft with your patients. But let's say you decide to do something funky like interstitial lung disease, and you pick that scope of practice. But on a daily basis, you're not using it. What advantage are you getting out of this? Nobody cares that you have an interest in hypertension. Who cares? This is practically what you're going to use. Once you become a prescriber, develop your skills in hypertension, develop your skills in asthma. No, good for you. Do it. But prior to this, think of practical what will give me value. So DBS check, personal statement, DPP, scope of practice. Think of that as a pharmacist. Think of the GPCPS service. If you're working in general practice, look at your clinical skill. Maybe you can spend time in areas such as long-term conditions. Also, there's a shortage of nurses and doctors in minor or acute illnesses. When was the last time you heard on the press, we have a shortage of doctors for hypertension. We have a shortage of nurses for asthma. We have a shortage of, there isn't. There might be, but it's not common. It's minor illnesses, acute conditions. Every time a patient could be seen in primary care, he ends up in secondary at cost. Otitis media, otitis externa, otitis media, otitis externa, rash, chest pain, shortness of breath, earache, a child with vomiting, diarrhea, nausea. This is where the NHS is struggling, not hypertension. Not hypertension, okay? So that is a bit about the application form itself. I've gone through that with you. I now want to go through what to expect at university. So at university, you will have to identify your learning needs. They will want you to identify your learning needs and they want this to be signed with your prescriber. They also want you to explain how you're going to achieve this. Okay, once you've done this, you have to make a log of all your hours like I've done here, you have to log every hour that you've done that has to be signed. And this slightly varies from university to university. After that, you will have an OSCE. Some of you will have an OSCE on Zoom. Some of you will have an OSCE face-to-face. -face. You will have an OSCE that you have to do live and an OSCE that you're going to have to do with the university. You will also have to write a written piece on your reflection. And again, this can vary from university to university. And you are going to also have to fill out your prescribing competency framework. They will want you to justify how you take an appropriate history, demonstrate that, and then your DMP has to sign this, that yes, I am vouching for this person. He can take a history, he can assess and interpret results. This is what they want. When this all gets signed off, all of this will then get signed off. You'll then get a signature from the university. You'll do your practice. And then after that, what has to happen is you then will be annotated on the register a couple of months later. So what you need to learn is number one, there are gonna be exams. And these exams are on pharmacology mainly. That's what they're on. There's gonna be OSCEs that I have to do where I will have to demonstrate history taking physical examination. There is also going to be coursework, written and essays. Whether you like it or not, there's academic stuff that you're gonna to have to do. There's going to be essays that you're going to have to do. That is also going to have to be me developing my skills. This is essentially university. So exam at the end of the semester. Reflective pieces. And some universities have a lot of essays that you have to write. There's also going to be your practice log that you have to fill out as well. In addition to your practice log, there is also going to have to be these things that I've mentioned to you there. Does anybody have any question questions on expectations from university in terms of the course itself? Essay, OSCEs, exam. Any questions? So far, and anything that I've discussed, we're gonna to get to the scope of practice I've discussed. I'll get into how to find a DMP in a moment. Any questions so far? You can write them on there. If there are no questions, I want to show you something, and that is a timetable. Can you all see this timetable? Number one, what you're learning, you have an introduction, you have teaching on academic skills, you have about a formulary, you have consultation models, you then have documentation accountability, 
You then have courses on, hey, good old pharmacology and pharmacodynamics. You've got some more study on pharmacology and consultation skills, decision making, and you have an OSCE. Does anybody see anything about teaching you clinical skills here? Because I don't see you anywhere. You have prescription writing. Hey, using the BNF, I thought we studied this for years as pharmacists, but there you go. I thought we did a five-year qualification on pharmacology. You've got more pharmacology. Public health, supervision, adverse drug reactions, reflective writing, remote prescribing, some more pharmacology. You have a numeracy exam. You have preparation. You've got more pharmacology. You've got another numeracy exam. Can you see this course is not designed to teach you any clinical skills? That's one university. Let me show you another university. I'm going to show you another university. What's a DPP? A DPP, Mary, is your, is your supervisor who will supervise your course. Without a DPP, which could be a doctor or pharmacist, you cannot do this course. Have a look at this again. Look what we have here, folks. Can you believe it or not? Yes, the DMP, it's the same thing. Have a look what we have here. We have an introduction. We have a welcome. Ooh, more pharmacology, more pharmacokinetics, more pharmacodynamics. Do you guys get the point? Does everybody get what I'm trying to explain to you? There is no clinical skills teaching here. No, there is no university that aims it for pharmacists. Absolutely not. I will tell you how you can develop your skills. There is no university that will do this for you. Uh, is my, why can't I not move down? Okay, again, adverse drug reactions, pharmacodynamics, adverse drug reactions. Yeah, you got a numeracy mock again. This is another university. Apparently there's something to do with online attendance. You have GI pharmacology, you've got respiratory pharmacology, cardiovascular pharmacology, endocrine pharmacology, more pharmacology. Mm, remember you're paired with nurses. Legal aspects of prescribing, legal considerations, pharmacology, pain, antifungal, antibiotic, and then you've got your exams. There is no clinical skills training on this course. So Eliza Oskies is where, for example, I can teach you a skill and then I will observe you to do it. Maybe I can teach you how to take a blood pressure, then they observe you to do it. That's what this is, okay? Does everybody get my point that there is no clinical skills training? Is that clear for everyone? They're not teaching you clinical skills. There is no clinical skills training here. They're just a lot of OSCEs and a lot of pharmacology. So that's my point I wanted to mention to you so you don't get misinformed why, because I made that mistake. The course itself is six months from university, remember that, because I made that mistake. So the course itself is six months. Someone asked how long the course is, six months. It ends up being about eight months, to be honest. Okay, let's get back on our, let's get back on the journey that we're on. Okay, right, where were we? Let's get back on the journey that we were on, we were here. Okay, so finding a university, I've been through that. Filling out the application, I've been. Now, how do you find a DMP or DPP? The reality is before COVID happened and before all these pharmacists ended up rushing into DP practice, Doctors were happy to take you on. Now it's a bit tricky because if you think about it, here's a general practice here. And this is your general practice. And now who do we have in that general practice? You have a doctor, you have a nurse, and now it is very common to have their own pharmacists or they'll have their paramedics. It is very difficult now to find somebody to supervise you because this gap is filled. Going back about seven, eight years ago, it was a lot easier because essentially they needed you. But right now, that's not the case. And this is why it's a problem at the moment to find it. However, some things that you can do is you could start sending out emails to a bunch of GPs and next to you and email them and say, right, I want to do my normal medical prescribing. I need you to assist me with this. In return, I will do this for you. I will, maybe you can assist with staff training. I'm happy to, to, to 
do medicines reconciliation. I'm happy to essentially do your meds reviews. You have to give someone, you have to give them something in return. You have to give them something in return. And what I will do is on one of my webinars, when I, when I put the recording for this, I will put your template of an email that I drafted out about seven, eight years ago to GPs that you can have a look at, that you can use to draft up to them if you can't find a doctor, okay? But you need to give them something in return. Remember the GPs are struggling with backlog of appointments. They're struggling with meds reviews. They're struggling with diagnosing and treating disease. If you can speak their language, they will take you on. But that is also on the basis of how hungry you are. It's a numbers game, folks. You have to look at your locality and you have to start emailing all of them. If that means going there face to face, drop a letter off to them. If that means calling them and call them up, it just depends how much grit you have and how, how bad you want this. You have to email them, you have to give them something in return. So maybe you can say, I will do meds reviews. I will train staff. I will train staff how to triage properly. I will help you. I will help you with doing your RA, RD prescriptions. Now, I know for some of you be like, I don't have any skills in this. What am I supposed to do? What will I offer them? I understand that. I understand it can be tricky. I get that it can be, it can be difficult, that it can be do that. Uh, no, your, I'll go through your DMP. Your DMP doesn't have to be local. So we organize a lot of training for a lot of pharmacists locally. And we've done over 170 to 180 students that we've helped. So we organize that. And our doctors actually do them training on Zoom and face-to-face -face events. So your DMP doesn't have to be local. It can't be a family member. It doesn't have to be local. But essentially when you are selecting a DMP, make sure number one, that they have skills and training. Number one, training. Have they trained a pharmacist before? Why? Because your needs are different to a nurse. Number two, have they the experience? Are you getting someone to teach you who doesn't have experience himself? That's why I prefer a clinician who has seen patients in hospital, who has seen cases, who has years of experience and not someone who's specializing in one area. That's why I prefer to go with medics because they, they're doctors, they've seen it all. So if you are gonna select a DMP, does it not make more sense to go with someone who's trained pharmacists before? And secondly, has experience versus someone who doesn't. Also, I can't highlight the importance of them having teaching experience. There is a difference in teaching and there's a difference in signing a piece of paper. You want to give value from your prescribers. You don't want it to be any Tom, Dick and Harry. You want to think, hold on, I'm spending a year with you. I want to make sure I get the right training. And for those of you who have struggled, we at Medlin can help you we can organize your prescribing for you. We can give you the clinical skills. We can do everything. We'll discuss that in a moment. But for now, please don't sell yourself short. I get too many students who come to me who've sold themselves short, have done their non-medical prescribing, have not got the clinical skills. And then they come to Medlin and say, Fahim, can you teach me the clinical skills? Because you've sold yourself short. Why? Speak with your DMP and say, look, I'm going to develop myself. If I'm going to do my prescribing, I want your support. So I can tell you how you're going to do it. So number one, how to find a DMP is going to be the good old fashioned way of having grit. And you're going to call, you're going to email, you're going to put an application in, you're going to find someone, you're not going to give up. And for those of you who are still struggling, then Medlin can organize it for you. But I don't want you to pay for something when you haven't tried yourself. At least try yourself to do it. But I'll be very honest with you, it's very difficult at the moment, simply because of the rationale I've told you, because at the moment it's tricky. But if you've tried all that, we can organize it for you. We can do it. Does your DMP have to be local? No. With COVID, he could be sat in London and you could be in Manchester. He could be in, he could be in Oxford and you could be in Wales. The point is, are you getting the right training? That's the point. Are you getting access to patients? You've got to think to yourself, am I getting the right training? Okay. Does anybody have any other questions about DMP? I'll tell you in a minute how we can help you with that solution. Does that make sense and how you're gonna find one? It's the good old fashioned way. Other than we can organize it for you. I can organize it for you, but I'd like to organize it for students once you've said, Fahim, I've tried everything, I'm struggling. We can organize it all for you. Does anybody have any questions about finding a DMP? Are you clear how to do this? The DMP's job is to support you, 
The DOP's job is to help you with training. He is there to give you the experience. He's there to support you, not just to sign your papers. Does that make sense to you all? I think you're all okay with this. Now, your 90 hours of clinical practice, at least 45 hours, should be with your DMP. At least half of them I'd recommend should be with your DMP or your non or your designated medical prescriber. The remaining 45 hours can be certain tasks you're doing, certain workbooks, whatever it might be. But 45 hours needs to be with your DMP, at least. At least that much, I would say. at least 30%. That's a bit more than 30%, but I would say at least 30% should be with your DMP. When you sit with him and you go through things, the rest of the task could be self-study, seeing patients, doing cases, supervising a pharmacist, supervising another clinician, anything else, but at least 90 hours should be with them. And be prepared for your examination skills. In a minute, I'll go through any questions that you'll have. This is essentially what will happen. So you'll, you'll find number one, first of all, find DMP or contact Medlin. That's the first thing you need to do. Number two, choose scope of practice and be real, be real. Number three, enhance DBS check. When does university start? University have applications in July and university have applications in, starts in September. So they start in, sorry, the next intake is September. The universities end, so end intake, July. And the reality is even with Medlin, we have short spaces. We have probably a maximum now of five to six places left and that's it, unfortunately. We don't have more than five to six places now because all our DMPs are booked at the moment. So we do have five to six places only. Unfortunately, out of the 100 plus students that are here on YouTube and live, we only have five to six places, not more than that. So those of you who are interested, I'll tell you how to get in touch but that's all we have to help you with this, unfortunately. Even with universities, their intake ends in July. Mm -hmm. They have an intake in September, they have an intake that ends in July to start in September, and they have another course that starts in January. So, well, let me clarify this point. So intake, September, in January and September. Some do have an intake in March, but the deadline for the September one is July, end of July. For March, it's normally January. And for the intake in January, you're looking at winter time. So around October, November, October, around October type, August, October. So for you guys who are looking to apply, you have a very short deadline for July to get into September. Now, universities do vary. Universities do vary in this. So get in touch with your provider. Okay, keep that in mind that you're working at tight schedules. So why do you wanna become a non-medical prescriber? Number one, you could set up your private clinic. Number two, you could work in general practice. Number three, number three, uh, I'll go through I'll go through how we help with, with, with non-medical prescribing. I'll go through that in a minute. So why you want to do it? Because in sync yourself with the NHS, make a difference to people's lives, folks. Number two, increase your opportunities, your skill set, and your salary will increase naturally, but only if you can do it. So there's definitely, we all know that there is advantages to becoming a prescriber. If you're working in a community pharmacy, you can set up your own clinic. You can set up online clinic. You could go work in general practice and diagnose, manage, and treat. You could start to teach. There's so much that you can do with it, okay? So I don't have much time to go through those benefits. In terms of the pitfalls, the mistakes that some of you folks are going to make is you are going to try and do it without taking my advice, number one. Number two, you will not develop your clinical skills and what will happen after your course is you'll land up on my doorstep saying, Fahim, teach me clinical skills because I've got my qualification, but I can't use it. Another pitfall that you're going to do is you're going to, you're not going to have a proper scope of practice and you're going to pick a wrong scope of practice where you're going to pick something obscure. You're going to pick a scope of practice like I'll do hypertension, but you're not seeing hypertensive patients. 
Number f another mistake you're going to make is you're going to start paying people to act as your DMP and you're not going to demand from them to actually teach you properly and then things go wrong. That's the mistakes you're going to make. Number one mistake, you will ignore me, which is fine. Do it at your pearl. <laughs> Number two, you will not pick a proper scope of practice. Why? Because I've taught over 100 plus students, so I know the mistakes are happening in there. Number three, you won't find a DMP because there's, it's very tough. So you'll apply, you won't find it. Number four, you may choose not to invest in yourself. I don't know why, but some of you <laughs> may choose not to invest in yourself. Uh, you will you will be too late for uni or you'll pick the wrong university, you won't make the right choices. So these are some of the mistakes that commonly get made in a maid. The main one that I see is the clinical skills. You, you won't develop clinical skills. You'll become maybe so desperate that you'll go with anything. You need to develop your clinical skills itself, okay? These are some of the pitfalls that will happen. So what we find with pharmacists who don't do it right is you end up losing your license and getting your service done. You end up killing people, unfortunately, if you don't develop your skills properly, folks, because you're diagnosing and managing and treating disease. There is a right way to do this. There's a right way to do this, okay? So these are just two articles, what happens when things go wrong. Moving on, this is essentially what you need to do. Develop your skills in anatomy, physiology, general medicine, history taking, physical examination, then you go to your prescribing. And in all our Medlin courses, we teach you all of this. We take on a student, we say, right, for him, you wanna become a prescriber, we will teach you the relevant anatomy, we will teach you the relevant physiology, we will fill out your application form for you, we will, ag we will allocate a DMP, we will find a suitable, area that you should be prescribing in and we will help you with the clinical practice. We will do everything for you. So at the end of it, you can diagnose, manage and treat. And what we will do is we will give you a better than money back guarantee. If you pay for our courses, if it doesn't work out for you, it's not happened with our thousand students, we will give your money back 100% guarantee. It's not gonna happen now. This is what we will help you with. If you're gonna do it on your own, remember for every single disease, you have to know this. Let me write this down. Every single disease, you need to know how to diagnose and manage, and that is, first of all, the incidence. How common is that disease? Tell me, if you had a patient who travels from Africa and he's got fever, night sweats, aches and pains, tell me one condition that you think it could be that is not common in the UK. Anybody tell me. He's come from Africa. Thank you very much, Eliza, malaria. So the incidence is important. Let's say you get somebody who travels from India and starts feeling He's got a cough, he's got a fever. Tell me which condition it could be. TB, COVID, okay. You've got a female patient who develops lower abdominal pain. She's missed her periods. Tell me what condition it could be. Yes, Eliza, ectopic pregnancy, absolutely. So the incidence is very, very important, okay? Etiology, tell me what is the treatment for acute otitis media. What's the common cause for acute otitis media? Who can tell me? What's the common cause for acute otitis media? A ear infection that children normally get, viruses. So if you know it's viruses, you're not gonna treat it with antibiotics. So you have to know that. Tell me sex. Tell me uh, an adult versus a child who is more commonly going to develop acute otitis media, adult or child? Who's more commonly going to get acute otitis media? Child. Why? Because of eustachian tube dysfunction. Well done. Okay, age. Let's see. Uh, you get a... Let's think of a disease that's more common in a particular age. Uh, a male patient above the age of 60 has issues with his stream, uh, is getting starting to get a bit of discharge, a bit of pain when he urinates. Male patient, 60 plus. Name me one condition that could be relevant for him. Thank you, prostate, well done. Okay, you need to know the pathology. 
So what does happen when you develop the disease itself? You have to know that about the disease. If you don't know that, how are you going to treat? How do you know that when you develop something like asthma, it could be because of a hypersensitivity reaction or it could be because of epithelial mesenchyle trophic unit dysfunction? You have to know this, okay? That's important for you to remember. It is your responsibility to know this. If you don't know this, how will you treat? So the pathology is important. What does happen on a, on a level, on a microscopic level, so then you can see the signs and symptoms. Tell me the, name me one symptom or sign for appendicitis. One symptom or sign for appendicitis. Anybody? You can search on Google. Who can tell me? Right, <laughs> right hand, not, <laughs> that's right. You can get pain on the right upper quadrant, the hypochondriac region, and then that can, de that can go to the right, or the, the right lower quadrant or the right iliac fo fossa. Absolutely right. That's correct. So that's a, that's a very, very good question regarding uh, uh, Nihal's ask question. I would like to ask about the independent prescription privilege that we'll be providing to the new foundation here, please. Nihal, I'm not going to be able to go into that in depth right now, but I want to cover this, but I will certainly go through this in depth. Just drop me an email and I'll go through that in depth with you. I just got to get through this at the moment. When you can do all this, that's when you go on to do your prescribing. Is everybody clear with that? Remember I told you the story at the start. Why nurses got the rights to prescribe is because they could already do this. That's why the course is not designed to teach you clinical skills. The course does not teach you this. It is designed for someone who already has the skills but needs a legal qualification and that's exactly what it does. Okay? A clinic, okay, a diploma. A diploma, a clinical diploma teaches you nothing about clinical skills. Please write this down. Have a look at the learning outcome for a clinical diploma. It does not teach you clinical skills. So the clinical diploma does not teach you clinical skills. My advice to you is, if you have the capacity, if you have the capacity to develop your clinical skills alongside your prescribing course, great. If you don't have that, then develop your clinical skills first, then do your prescribing. And I can show you how we can do that and we can teach you to do that. The decision is for you to make. A lot of students do become overwhelmed. They want to rush towards, hey, I want to do my prescribing, do my prescribing. That's not the right way to do it. You're gonna make a mistake. I know when I started taking on pharmacists to become prescribers, I would sit them, I would sit them with, uh, I would sit them with uh, my doctors and I would think I've made a mistake here because these pharmacists don't have clinical skills. That's why I revamped all my courses. I said, you know what? I'm gonna to have to teach them clinical skills now. I'm gonna develop a course that teaches them clinical skills and then they do their prescribing because they would sit with the doctor, be gobsmacked. Like, what are you talking about? How do I take a history? How do I do an examination? How do I record properly? It wouldn't work. That's why I've gone back and developed to help pharmacists do this the right way. So now that you're asking me questions, how much does it cost for him? How can you help us? Let's get right into this. Ooh, <laughs> I'll delete this. So we've been through our vision here. Right, number one. First of all, I want you guys to be the best versions of yourself. That's what I want you to do. That's the first, the most important thing. That's the most important thing. Number two, I want you to better lives. And I also want you to develop your careers and make money as well because I don't want you folks to be financially poor. If you're financially rich, you can make a difference in life. So I want you to do this. I want you to also be the future for our pharmacy and strengthen your position in the market itself. Okay, so, right. Our course habits design, let me break this down for you. Number one, we will take on a student and we will first of all, start to see where you are with your course and what your needs and goals are. I need to hear from you, what is it you need to do? There are three courses that we offer. Number one, develop clinical skills so you can diagnose and manage and treat a range of chronic and acute conditions. That's course number one. Course number two that we offer is for pharmacists to become prescribers where we organize your DMP. We help you with the application form. We help you with your scope of practice. We do all that for you. And number three, we help, oh, number three, we help pharmacists set up private clinics 
and businesses. That's the three courses that we do. Very easy and period. If you ask me, Fahim, what are the three things that you can help me with? We can help you develop your clinical skills. We will help you learn the relevant anatomy, learn the relevant physiology, well the relevant uh, minor illness, minor conditions, well the relevant general medicine, and we can help you become prescribers if you're not a prescriber. If you're already a prescriber, then we can help you utilize that skill. You'll go this way. If you aren't a prescriber, you will go this way. For those of you that want to set up your private clinics, whether it's aesthetics, we can help you with all. We can combine courses together where we can help you and put you on a journey where we can develop your clinical skills and you do your prescribing. We can do that for you, okay? We can do that for you. But remember that we cannot give you a prescribing qualification. You still have to go to university for that. But this is how it will happen. So you understand this. So here's the university, right? Let's draw the university here. There's the university. Okay, there is our beloved universities here. There's the university there. Okay, the universities will give you a qualification. That's what they will give you. We will help you, Medlin will help you use my qualification and help, help me get, get onto the course. How we will do that is we will organize your DMP for you. We will organize the DMP for you. We will fill out the application with you. That includes your personal statement, scope of practice, and so on. We will organize your 45 hours with our doctor. And our doctor does this via, one of our clinicians will do this 45 hours via Zoom. And then 45 hours face to face teaching with myself or one of my other colleagues that you'll be teaching face to face. We do that. What our course covers is diagnosis and management of a range of acute conditions, history taking and physical examination in all the body systems. And you will learn how to be able to put this all into practice. We do this via our e-learning. So you have e-learning that you have to go through our courses. I'll show you them in a moment. You have face-to-face -face classes. You have live webinars and you have your workbooks that you have to work through that have been designed for your students itself. So what we do, we will take on a student and say, right, Mary, you want to develop your clinical skills? You want to become a prescriber? We'll help you with that. If you're a pharmacist prescriber, we will help you utilize your skill in two ways, to set up your clinic or develop your clinical skills. If you're not a pharmacist prescriber and you want to become one, we will organize your DMP for you and we will organize the training. You might say for him, but how do you train? We have our own e-learning portal, which I'll show you here. And we cover all the diseases. So I'll show you in a second. These are just a snippet of the conditions that we cover. We cover acute conditions, chronic conditions. We cover over a thousand plus conditions that we will teach you on. But in these six months, you won't be able to cover all of them, but you'll get through a, a chunk of them. You will simply say, hey, Fahim, that's great. So I have, I can log on to the Medlin website like this. I have access to my own learning portal, which was here, which has disappeared. Where has it disappeared? Where has it disappeared? That's weird. Here you go. You'll log on here and you'll go to my dashboard, for example, and you will log on to our, for example, here's an example of ear, nose and throat. And these are all our courses. Uh, here's an example of our teaching. So you can see that all our courses are e-learning courses. What are the learning? So all our courses, our theoretical, this is the theory part. All our courses are interactive. You will learn, you will get access to all the theory that you needed to. So the location of the I love ear. this slide. Where Check this is slide the out. location of the ear? Where is it Check located? this slide out. Now you might say for him, the ear itself is located at the sides of the head, which is true. But exactly where is it located? So as I mentioned, I, got, I get bored of YouTube videos. I think they, they can get quite boring. So they make it interactive. All our courses are interactive. 
they are in line with level seven, in line with uh, the H health education in the level of education that's required for pharmacists. So you can see that we have, again, I just want to show you, uh, again, you get access to, you know, it's, it's very much hands-on. We teach you and show you everything from start to finish, an example of mastoiditis. So we teach you the whole relevant anatomy, the whole relevant physiology. We cover it all in depth from your OSCEs, your history taking, you name it from start to finish, we cover it, question slides, all. So our theoretical courses will cover everything for you, for your theory. You then have to attend our live webinars that we do twice a month with one of our doctors. And then you also have to attend our face-to-face -face classes. So you have your e-learning, which you develop your theory. You have the live webinars. You have the face-to-face -face classes. And you've got your doctor with your DMP. We cover it all and we cover better than a money back guarantee. And there's two prices. The cost of the course itself is £3,000, which includes your DMP, help with your and your non-medical prescribing, but does not include the e-learning. The e-learning course is included at 3995. So at £3,995 includes all my e-learning, my DMP, face-to-face -face events, all over, multiple times we cover. The £3,000 course includes spending time with my doctor, help with the application and so on. But we cover it all. And for all of our students, we offer a better than money back guarantee. But this does not include university fees, as I mentioned, that <coughs> we cannot give you access to a qualification. We teach you the clinical skills. I hope that's clarified everything from start. Unfortunately, we only have, as I mentioned, a couple of spaces left, I think up to five, six, and that's it for this year. And then it's gonna be next year. So that's kind of where we are at the moment. I've gone through the platform. Again, you know, this, you log on, you, need to you, you log on, you, you'll see the courses. They're all interactive. You know, all these courses are designed to be interactive. Plenty of students, we've got over a thousand students, but I think I've covered everything. Which university should I attend? I've gone through that with you. How should I fill out the application? I've gone through that with you. The role of the prescribing pharmacist, if you work in general practice, I want you all to do two things. Log on to my, subscribe to my YouTube channel, number one. Number two, I want you, for those of you who want to work in general practice, I want you to do this. I want you to go on to Medlin and sign up to our free webinars. And these free webinars will basically, we cover, I've done all the courses on, I've covered, if you go to medlin.com, go to Medlin webinar series, what to expect in general practice, how to become a non-medical prescriber, how to develop your clinical skills, plenty of free webinars that you can go there. Sign up for free and I've covered it all because a lot of you have the same questions, the future of pharmacy, how to develop my clinical skills, why should I invest in myself? How should I, what do I expect in general practice? How do I go into general practice? Non-medical prescribing, everything covered. I've done it all there for you, okay? So that should solve that problem for you there. So that being said, I have believe I've covered everything from the start. DMP versus DPP, if you are, I had a pharmacist call me a couple of weeks ago that I'm gonna do it with a pharmacist. And I said, look, if your pharmacist is gonna act as your DMP, what value are they giving you? If this pharmacist can only specialize in asthma, what's the point? How many patients have they seen? How much experience do they really have? Be very, very careful with who you go with. I've had pharmacists who have gone and done courses elsewhere and come back to me saying, I can't use my skill. Our job and guarantee to you is that you will be able to do this at the end of the course. We are developing a unity. We have over a thousand students. You will be part of that. Can I do this on a part-time basis? Yes, you can. On our courses, I'm only asking for you to study 20 to 30 minutes a day. That's all I'm asking for. If you can dedicate 20 to 30 minutes a day, you will not have a problem with the courses. Can you study at home? Absolutely, you can. Your time commitment for the course itself, as I told you, you need to be dedicated to the university courses. There's a lot of essays, but we can help you with the essays. We can help you with the course for practice. We can help you with exams. We can help you with everything. You don't have to worry about it. We will help you with everything, okay? That is the future of our profession. I've gone through the cost. I've gone through choosing your scope of practice. I've done through that with you as well. I've gone through duration. 
how does your company sponsor you? Medlen can sponsor you or your regular area can sponsor you. Job opportunities, should I consider advanced clinical practice? I think I'll do, an, I'll do a webinar on that soon, whether I think you should do that. I've gone through what universities, do I need to be community pharmacy to undertake? No, you don't. <coughs> if you're not qualified for two years, you should be developing yourselves now. Don't make the mistakes that I've made. I am conscious of time because I have ran over. I do apologize for that. And a clinical diploma folks does not teach you clinical skills. Nope, nope, nope. I've done my clinical diploma. It does not teach you clinical skills. It does not teach you clinical skills. It is not designed for that. Now, let me go through some questions that you folks might have. Let's go through some questions that you have. Right. Will NHS subsidize the cost of IP in community pharmacy? Yes and no. Yes and no. Some do, some don't. In terms of clinical skills, is there a list of what we can any what we can go and learn and learn during the course itself? You can look. I've done the webinar on developing the clinical skills, Mark. I suggest that you go on to that. I'd recommend you do that. But ultimately, you develop your skills on anatomy and physiology. There are plenty of books that you can go through. I'll be doing a separate webinar on this that will get you to go. But there's plenty of ways that you can develop your clinical skills. But do you have the time? It's taken me around five, six years to do it all on my own. It's not because you're not capable. It's time. It's time. Can you give an example of an area of clinical skills which you have seen lacking in qualified NMP. So uh, an area that I would say with the qualified NMP, absolutely. If you look at non-medical prescribers, an area that they will lack, for example, have they got the clinical experience to deal with something like, let's just say asthma, for example, a, a qualified NMP, can he do spirometry? Does he really understand all the various different volumes are involved. Can he diagnose and treat asthma properly? It takes practice, hypertension, cardiovascular disease. It is impossible for a, a non-medical prescriber to become a doctor. It's not possible unless you've got years of experience. So all of us will have a defined skill set and we have to work within our skill set. But if you're saying to me that can a pharmacist after just three, four years of qualification become like a doctor, I, would, I don't think it's possible because you don't have the time and experience, not because you're not capable. Experience is important there. Uh, what does MMS, MMSSP stand for? I'm not sure what that stands for myself. I'm not sure what that is. Oh, so I think, uh, how much is the clinical course on its own, Zora? The clinical course on its own is 2995. 2,995 pounds is the clinical course itself. And that gives you access to face-to-face -face classes. It gives you access to live webinars, time with our doctors, and all the skills itself. We cover all that it, uh, it's from start to finish. So standalone, if you said, Fahim, look, I don't want to develop my, I just want to develop my clinical skills first. I want to be able to diagnose, manage, and treat disease. That's £2,995. We will be getting in touch with you to go through it in depth, but that covers everything for you. Whew. Now, five minutes. Anybody got any questions? Fire away. I'll answer anything. That I can that I can answer, that I'm capable of answering for you today. How long is our courses? Our courses, technically speaking, there's over a thousand diseases that we cover, and essentially the first year you pay two thousand nine hundred ninety-five pound. After that, it's thirty pound a month. After that, it's thirty pound a month. That's it. So our courses, we take on a student and intend to work with you for life. We don't take you on and say, hey, let's teach you because like your learning is never ended. So you first initially pay £2,995 and you can pay monthly installments. We do offer installments. After that, it's £30 a month, okay? Uh, where are the face-to-face -face training? Our face-to-face -face training are usually in Oxford, but we are running face-to-face -face training in London and Manchester, various different areas itself, but usually in Oxford. Any other question, folks? Do we have to work in GP practice already or is it okay? Absolutely work in community pharmacy. I work in community pharmacy. I've worked in general practice. I worked in community pharmacy, that's correct. Avani says, is 395 for clinical skills plus help with IP? Correct. But if you wanted to just do, let me clarify this. If you wanted to just become an IP and you don't want access to everything else that Medlin does, you only want the 90 hours with my doctor, help with my scope of practice, help with my, face-to-face -face training is £3,000. If you want everything else, I get to be part of a community. I get to learn how to diagnose, manage, and treat disease. I get to do multiple face-to-face -face events. 
I get tutoring by yourself, that is 3995. And if you just don't want any of that, then it's 2995. Right, I think I've answered everything. Woohoo! Great. Uh, brilliant. Okay, folks, if you've got no more questions, I my colleagues will be getting in touch with you to we will be giving you a call to see essentially how is it we can help you. But remember, it's what you need, not what I need. Remember that. It's what your learning is, not, not what, what my learning needs are. We'll be getting in touch with you. We ha only have a short space. I wish you all the best of luck. Sign up to those webinars. Let's make a difference together, folks. Have a wonderful evening. Oh, sorry. Before you go, before you go, before you all go. I'm so silly. I forgot to say this to you. There's the contact. There's my contact number. I'm going to leave it there for you because I get this question all the time. If Fahim, how do we get in touch? Where's the email? There's my contact number. And this is essentially how you can get hold of me. So there's my contact number. There is the email, one of my colleagues, Aisha, who deals with this side will get in touch. So you can see that, you can jot it down. I'm more than happy to help. You can follow me on LinkedIn. There's my number and there's the email. Somebody at Medlam will get in touch with you. I wish you all the best of luck. God bless you all. I'll leave this here. And anybody got any questions, just answer them. I'll go through it with you step by step. Why, right, Eliza, thank you very much, folks. I'm here for a bit. If you need me for anything else, do let me know. And for my side, have a safe journey, folks. I will be in touch.